the cardiovascular system or mainly our heart is responsible for supplying blood to all parts of our body. Now this blood is carried in blood vessels which resemble little pipes. Now these vessels could be called veins, arteries and capillaries. Now any damage or leakage to these pipes will cause the blood to ooze out of the body. Now this blood is super important since it is a nutrient source for the body. So it must not be allowed to leak out and go to waste. Now to control this or stop this leakage, the mechanism employed by our body is called hemostasis. Now the word hemostasis can also be spelled as hemostasis with an A. Now to understand the word hemostasis properly, we must break it down into two terms, which is hemo and stasis. Now hemo comes from an ancient Greek word meaning blood or and stasis meaning motionless or stopping. You can also remember this by static or to halt. So together it will mean to stop the leakage of blood or prevention of blood loss meaning to keep the blood within a damaged blood vessel. Now you must be wondering that this term sounds awfully similar to the word homeostasis, but these two must not be confused. You can distinguish them by breaking these two terms down. Homeostasis is the steady state of internal, physical and chemical conditions that are maintained by living systems. And hemostasis obviously means prevention of blood loss. Always keep this in mind. Now the question arises, what actually happens in hemostasis? And what are the steps involved? So our story will start from vessel damage or the pipe getting a leak due to an injury. First up, there will be an immediate action which is termed as vasoconstriction this is an intrinsic action of the vessels. Now different mechanisms are put into place to constrict this blood vessel and reduce the blood flow to the site of vascular damage. Then we have the temporary solution to the leak, like you would gag the pipe leak temporarily with a cloth. Now in the body, this is known as the platelet clot or the platelet plug. This will be termed as primary hemostasis. The time required for this plug to form is mainly 2 to 4 minutes, which is known as the bleeding time. Now after that, we will call the professional help, like the plumber, to permanently fix this leak. Now this is known as the blood clot formation or secondary hemostasis. Now this mechanism involves the coagulation cascade and then eventual growth of fibrin meshwork in the blood clot to close the hole in the vessel permanently. We will talk about all these mechanisms in great detail one by one. So these are the three main steps that are employed in hemostasis. Now you must keep all of these in mind. So the three steps were vasoconstriction, primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. Now you must note the key players that are involved in each of these steps. Now these are the platelets, the clotting factors and the fibrin fibers that are stabilizing the platelets at the site of damage. We will see how each of these are involved as our story builds. Now starting off with the platelets. These are blood cells in the plasma that stop bleeding by sticking together to form a clot. They're also known as thrombocytes. Now you must be wondering where do they come from? Well, they're formed in the bone marrow, which is the soft spongy tissue inside the bone cavities. Now this formation of platelets is termed as thrombopoiesis. Now this formation is regulated by a protein hormone that is secreted by the liver and kidney, known as thrombopoietin. It is secreted into the bloodstream. Now, if you break down the word thrombo, it means thrombocytes, and poi means synthesis. 
and tin refers to protein. So it will mean a protein that helps in the synthesis of thrombocytes or platelets. Now it is also known as TPO and we will be using this abbreviation in the rest of the lecture. Now inside the bone marrow, the thrombopoietin will promote the production of myeloid stem cells or myeloid progenitor cells that are originating from hemocytoblasts, which are also known as hematopoietic stem cells. And this will lead to the production of megakaryocytes, which are extremely large hematopoietic cells in the bone marrow. Now, these megakaryocytes fragment into minute platelets in the bone marrow or soon after entering the blood. Now, if we zoom in, we can see that the platelets can be called as little pieces that are cut off from these cells. Just imagine the megakaryocyte as a tree and the platelets are broken off branches from it, which is why they don't have a nucleus, but they have other cytoplasmic structures. We will talk about all of these one by one because they are very significant in the role of the platelets to perform their function. Now let us recall some facts about the platelets. The platelets have a lifespan of 8 to 10 days. You must remember that they have a diameter of 1.5 to 3 micrometers. Now this variation is particularly important as they build up like little bricks so that it is more vital than a bigger structure. So it has the ability to be flexible in closing up the damaged vascular wall, depending upon the size of the hole. Now the normal concentration of platelets in the blood is between 150,000 and 400,000 cells per microliter of blood. So now if we separate these two values, we can note if the number of platelets fall below the number 150,000. It leads to a condition known as thrombocytopenia or megakaryocyte hypoplasia. Now, in this case, the blood of the patient will not clot normally due to the less amount of platelets present in the body. And if the platelet number rises more than 400,000, it leads to a condition known as thrombocytosis or megakaryocyte hyperplasia. Now, thrombocytosis is a condition in which there is an excessive number of platelets in the blood. And too many platelets can lead to certain conditions including a stroke, heart attack or a clot in the blood vessels. Now, this regulation, like I told you earlier, is regulated by, yes, thrombopoietin which is secreted by the liver and kidney, and it acts on the bone marrow. Now, in the case of thrombocytopenia, as the platelet count falls, the release of thrombopoietin is increased by the liver and kidney, and thus megakaryocyte and platelet production is stimulated. Now, on the flip side, in the case of thrombocytosis, when the platelet count rises, the thrombopoietin concentration in the plasma is reduced to reduce the production of platelets. And so equilibrium can be achieved and normal functions in the body will obviously work normally. Like I told you earlier that the platelets have no nucleus, but they contain certain cytoplasmic organelles since they are budded of structures of the bigger cells that were Yes, they were megakaryocytes. Now, they also have certain receptors on the outer membrane. Now, let's look at them one by one and see their details. Now, inside the platelets, we have the messenger RNA and residues of both endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. They synthesize various enzymes and especially store large quantities of calcium ions. We also have mitochondria and enzyme systems that can be found here that are capable of forming ATP and ATP. We can also find microtubules and actin and myosin molecules. 
which are contractile proteins similar to those found in muscle cells. We can also find lysosomes, which contain certain enzyme systems. Now, platelets have also two types of granules that are responsible for storing different materials for exocytosis. Now, these are the alpha granules and smaller electron dense granules or delta granules. Now, if we focus on these alpha granules, we know that they are unique to the platelets. They are the most abundant of these granules. They have a diameter of about 200 to 500 nanometers. Now, as the name suggests, they are the alpha. They are bigger. They are more abundant. So they will contain more substances. First up, they contain fibrinogen, also known as factor one. They will also have a von Willebrand factor that is employed for platelet adhesion. They also have P-selectin, which is expressed on the platelet membrane and causes adhesion with the von Willebrand factor. Then we also have platelet activating factor or PAF. Platelet factor four can also be found, which promotes platelet aggregation, platelet derived growth factor or PDGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF that regulates endothelial cell growth and division. And lastly, in the alpha granules, we have the plasmonogen activator inhibitor or PAI1. Now in the electron dense granules or delta granules, they are the second most abundant platelet granules. They measure about 150 nanometers in diameter. Now the contents in them are calcium, which is responsible for vesicle release and activation of several other mechanisms. ADP provides energy and activates calcium release. Serotonin and thromboxane A2, which are responsible for vasoconstriction. And also epinephrine. Now you can remember these via a mnemonic, cost, where C stands for calcium, A for ADP, S for serotonin, T for thromboxane, and E for epinephrine. So these were all the cytoplasmic organelles that are present within the platelets. So now if we look at the cell surface membrane, we can see that the platelet membrane contains a large amount of phospholipids that activate multiple stages in the blood clotting process, like the arachidonic acid. We will discuss this later. And also on the platelet cell surface, there's a coat of glycoproteins. Now they have the presence of certain receptors on them. Now these receptors are the glycoprotein receptors, the integrins, which are also a type of glycoprotein, purinergic receptors, and also fibrinogen receptors. Just keep these in mind for now. We will come back to this diagram at the end when we have discussed the whole process. The role of these receptors will be better elucidated over there. So now let's head on to the next sections to see what is actually happening in each of the steps of hemostasis where vasoconstriction and primary hemostasis is taking place. Let's take a deeper look.